I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the many lands on which we meet today and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. The authors you can see on this panel were all originally destined to be part of the Her Story Tour, a series of bookstore and library events throughout autumn this year. And they were actually scheduled to come and visit us at Kingcumber Library in April. Um, unfortunately, for the obvious reasons, that didn't happen. So um, I'm really, really pleased that we were able to facilitate this tonight. They all write historical novels that have strong female, often rebellious um, perspective at the centre of their narrative and deal with issues important to women at a particular point in history. Um, each, of these library, uh, each of these authors have books in store and in our libraries right now. Here is an established Australian author of historical fiction. In the past life, she was a teacher a journalist and a farmer. These days she haunts museums and writes. She's written numerous novels, including last year, The Woman in the Green Dress, and today she'll be talking about her most recent novel, The Girl in the Painting. Welcome. Thank you. This is Karen Brooks. Karen is an academic, a newspaper columnist, and a social commentator and has appeared regularly on national TV and radio. She is also the author of 13 books, including last year, The Chocolate Maker's Wife, but today she'll be talking about her most recently released book, The Darkest Shore. So a big welcome to you too, Karen. Thank you, lovely to be here, thank you. Mary Ann O'Connor is the author of five novels, including In a Great Southern Land, released last year. With a career in marketing behind her, Marianne now focuses on her writing. She will be discussing her just released novel, Where Fortune Lies. Hello. <laughs> Kerry Turner trained from a young age to become a ballerina, but life had other ideas for her. So she combined her love of ballet, history and books into her first novel, The Last of the Romanoff Dances. But today she will be discussing her most recent book, the Daughter of Victory Lies. Welcome. Hi, thank you for having me here. Welcome everybody. And we're gonna move straight into the questions. So first of all, um, can you give us a one minute insight into your book? What is sometimes called an elevator pitch? And we're gonna take this one to Tia first of all. Hi, um, my most recent book is The Girl in the Painting. It tells the story of Miss Elizabeth Quinn. She's something of an institution in Maitland Town. And when she's found cowering in the corner of the exhibition gallery, everybody knows that something strange has come to pass. Jane Pipe is determined to find out. She owes her life and her education to Elizabeth. But as the past and the present converge, Elizabeth's grip on reality loosens and Jane finds herself fighting to unravel Elizabeth's story before it's too late. Let's move on to Karen. Okay, hi. Um, my book is based on a terrible true story. It's set in Scotland between the years 1704 to about 1706. And it's basically about a group of fishwives in a small fishing village on the east coast of Scotland, Pittenween. And they're accused of um, witchcraft and persecuted and tortured. And leading the persecution is a malevolent reverend and some of his parishioners. So it's a very dark and bleak story, but also full of hope and light and the power of female friendship and what it means to fight for social justice. Thanks. We have Mary Ann. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Uh, Where Fortune Lies is my latest novel, and it brings together a group of people from all corners of the world, all different walks of life to end up, strangely enough, in the high country in Victoria in 1880, where they get mixed up with a bunch of bush rangers, and it's a bit of a wild tale. Uh, the main character, Anne Brown, becomes Christella Moore, and she's an exotic dancer and has this passionate affair with Charlie, who's an artist, and whose best friend, Will, has come out with political ambitions. But the whole story really culminates into trying to predict your fortune doesn't always work and sometimes you'll change your mind about what you want it to be. And last but not least, Kerry's going to tell us a little bit about her story. 
Yes, so the daughter of Victory Lights, it opens in London during the World War II years, and we follow Evelyn Bell, who, much to the chagrin of her sister, joins the first ever all-female searchlight regiment, where they use spotlights to light up enemy planes that are coming in to bomb London and Greater England. Her wartime experience opens up a post-war opportunity for her to join a boat called the Victory, which is a travelling burlesque boat full of people who are a little bit rebellious because the show is actually illegal. On board the Victory, Evelyn meets Humphrey, who is the owner and creator of the, sh the show on the boat, be a voluptuous burlesque dancer who is hiding some very big secrets, and Flynn, an American man who is really struggling under the weight of the things he did and saw during his time in the Graves Registration Unit as part of the war effort. Then the book flicks to 10 years later and we follow a little girl called Lucy who leaves the only life she's ever known in London to join a group of strangers on the Isle of Wight who are all connected to the victory. And when she starts her new life there, she hopes to also find out answers as to what happened to the mother that she never knew. What was it about this period of history that inspired you to write this book? Um, the painting is set in two different time periods, the 1860s and the early 20th century. I find both of them really intriguing. The 1860s in Australia was a time of upheaval and contradictions. The gold rush had seen an enormous influx of migrants to Australia from all corners of the world. And it was the beginning of the multicultural societies we now know. Unfortunately, it spawned a rash of prejudice and fear, which dictated many people's choices and had long lasting con consequences. 50 years later, at the beginning of the 20th century, fortunes had been made and lost, and most importantly, women had found their voice. But the implications of the past had huge ramifications for those who'd lived through both eras, and it provided a wonderful canvas to explore the emotional conflict caused by these historical events. Um, there was everything to love about this period, the early 1700s in Scotland. Um, basically, Scotland was suffering under the yoke of English oppression, which it had done for a long, long time anyway. But um, it was really exemplified through um, with rebellion in the form of the Jacobites and things like that. There was war, there was famine, there was witchcraft. I mean, during the period leading up to then and a bit after, over 4,000 people were accused and tried of witchcraft and two thirds of those were burnt, put to death, and most of them were women. So it was really um, fantastic fodder for a writer in so many ways. And um, just fascinating to delve, as Tia said, you know, into all those layers in the past and, and, and you know, create a story out of that. It's, it's hard not to when you've got so many tensions. And not only that, women were really coming to the fore and finding their voice in that period too. And that was really exemplified in the fishwives of the village that I write about, these strong, feisty, independent women who were both loved but also loathed for what they represented, which was women with a voice. Thanks. <laughs> well, this actually, this era really came alive for me. Many years ago when I saw the man from Surrey River with my father, um, he's, um, the artist Kevin Best, he's passed away now, and he painted thousands of paintings of the high country and I used to write poetry for him and I used to watch him paint and he was a beautiful man. And I, I really fell in love with that era and I fell in love with high country and I always want to write a book about it. Um, but what I discovered in my research was that it's actually pretty much the last days of the bush rangers and it's such an interesting part of our culture because we like to identify ourselves as supporting the underdog and this was a wild west frontier i think a lot of australians don't know that we had a wild west and it was wild you know i don't even know this west but it was wild frontier <laughs> and it was very much anti-authoritarian and very much you know the trappers versus the common man and bush rangers you know for all the bloodthirsty and terrible stories there was also some measure of respect and um, certainly the public were on their side in these country areas and you, you understand why and um, sort of winding the Ned Kelly tale in there was something very sacred to me as well so um, I hope it's a rollicking adventure but it was for me. Thanks Marianne and um, finally we have Kerry. Um, what's, what was it about the period of history for you 
that inspired you? Well, when we think of post-World War II years, it's quite natural to think of it as a pretty celebratory time for obvious reasons. But when I was doing my research, particularly whenever I came across a female perspective of the post-World War II years, I found that it was actually a time of great repression, particularly for women, because they had experienced this new kind of independence by being allowed into areas that they weren't previously allowed into, particularly in the workforce. And they enjoyed the independence and money and um, privilege that working for themselves brought. And when the war ended, they were expected to go back to a purely domestic life. But not only that, they were also expected to never speak about their wartime work because it was considered an insult to the returning servicemen to speak about that work. Then I also have burlesque as a really strong story element in my book, and it's because it reflects a similar thing. Burlesque was having its booming era post-war, during the war and post-war, and is obviously a very female-dominated art form, but it was actually illegal in those years and it could result in jail time for both performers and audience. So I really was struck by this idea that the war had brought freedom, but only a certain type of freedom if you were a female. And obviously a lot of women rejected that notion and pushed back against it and just decided to accept whatever um, consequences came their way from making their own choices. And my protagonist, Evelyn Bell, is very much one of those women. Yeah, she sounds very feisty. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. Um, research is an intrinsic part of historical fiction. What was the most interesting historical fact you uncovered and incorporated into your writing? And I'm going to throw to Karen first this time. Sorry, I wasn't ready. I didn't have my mic on. Um, sure, I think, well, I covered any number of facts, but most of them would pertain to witchcraft and just the level of uh, punishment and what the women were forced to endure. And I don't really want to go into that. You, you can read about it in the book, and I, I detail it quite strongly, and it's, it's heart-wrenching. I don't think I've ever cried so much writing it as I'm reading through these records of actual, actually what happened to them. But also the superstitions around fishing communities were absolutely fascinating. I had no idea there were so many superstitions. Everything from um, fishermen couldn't say certain words like pig or rabbit or uh, I think there was something like they couldn't eat an orange and if they did, they had to touch cold iron or they couldn't set sail. If they saw a minister of the cloth, they weren't allowed to set out to sea. But the, the most surprising one was that the women used to carry the men on their backs through the waves to the inshore boats to keep the men dry. Because, of course, if their clothing was wet and they're out at sea for hours and hours, if not days, then, you know, they ran the risk of illness and certainly having weighty clothing. So, you know, again, the women playing a really interesting role in preserving the men and keeping an industry going as well. And then, of course, you've got the other side of it with what happened to them when they're accused of being witches. So that was yeah. really interesting. I'm going to pass on to Kerry now um, and just have a little bit of insight into what um, was the most interesting historical fact you discovered. In my book, it was the wartime roles that I knew very little about and from talking to other people, uh, many people not seem to have heard about them a great deal. and They kind of deserve a little bit more attention, I think. And that is the all-female searchlight regiments, which it was very difficult for them to get this role in the first place. Um, men were needed at the front in the fighting roles, and women wanted to volunteer for these roles. But, of course, there was a lot of pushback because they were female. They didn't think they would be physically capable or mentally capable of doing this kind of work. However, there was extensive testing and training done, and the women actually proved themselves even better at the roles than the men did with these searchlights, but it still took a full year after the successful training for women to be allowed to become searchlight operators. And what that work involved was operating these massive spotlights uh, near the uh, anti-aircraft gunners. They would light up planes that were coming in, identify them as either friendly or enemy aircraft, 
so that they could either try to help them find their way home or the anti-aircraft gunners would try to gun them down before they were able to bomb anywhere. And it was highly, highly dangerous work. Um, people did die doing this work. The women were set at a distance from the anti-aircraft gunners because they didn't want to risk the men's lives or the ammunition with any return fire, so it came directly at the women. And they had no way of protecting themselves. They were not allowed to use guns. They had steel helmets, and that was it, which obviously doesn't do much <laughs> against an aircraft firing back at you. So that was completely fascinating to me. And then I also came across the wartime role of Gray's Registration Unit men in the American Army, which was a highly traumatic role that involved going into a battlefield after the battle had moved through and collecting and identifying the remains of fallen soldiers so they could let their families know what had happened to them. So two very different wartime roles, both of which I had never heard of personally, and made a lot of sense to me once you, you know about them, that of course that role had to exist. And I just found it completely fascinating and wanted more people to know about them. Yeah, definitely. I certainly didn't know about either of those those roles and they are pretty important roles um, but yeah like you say not very well known so yeah. thank you for sharing that one and Mary Ann I'm going to throw to you now um, a piece of interesting historical um, fact that you discovered well, mine's actually a person. <laughs> there, were, there were so many, you know, you could you could talk for hours about all the things you discover when you do these historical novels, of course, you know, um, but mine was a person and her name was Lola Montez and her original name was Marie Gilbert, uh, a real person, obviously, um, from Ireland, just an average girl, and she completely reinvented her life. And when I discovered this character, I, I knew I had to make her my heroine and my story, you know, based upon and it's still fiction but she this real lady you won't believe her life but she actually went all over Europe she became a countess then she became a courtesan to the king then she became a political activist and had to flee um, then she ended up in Australia on the gold fields doing the spider dance as an exotic dancer <laughs> she was also famous for horse whipping a journalist down the main street of Melbourne. Uh, she, she did all these incredible things, but her, her stage name was Lola Montez, and her original name was just Marie Gilbert. And to me, when life afforded so little opportunity to these people during this era, to women, I mean, there were so few things that they could do, but she just grabbed life and she ran with it. She ended up dying at the age of 39. Um, tragically of syphilis, but she was working in a refuge in New York for women, um, which is a rare thing of the time anyway. And I think it's quite a beautiful way to end such a life that she gave to others and gave back to women. But um, people will say that, oh, well, what a tragic life, but I think she lived every second. And I had to take her life and put some fictionalised lines upon it and, and make her come back to life in my novel. Yeah, definitely. So is that is that something that you um, particularly um, <laughs> find useful if you um, are embellishing? So do you find you have to embellish a lot for your characters? Yes. Well, I mean, I actually even played with the idea of, of writing almost a, bi a biographical novel, but I, I just sort of thought, oh, it's too hard. You, you've got to be so accurate. I mean, every novel I dabble with this idea, but you keep thinking, I'll get something wrong, you know. So I always end up fictionalising the character. But she was a very strong inspiration, and of course, you know, look at that life. And uh, especially once the research proved um, there were so few roles for women, so few opportunities. Yeah. Thank you. And Tia, um, your turn. <laughs> what did you discover historically? I there's all, I mean, as everybody else has said, there's always hundreds of interesting things. Um, I, w I was quite fascinated by the assassination attempt on Queen Victoria's son, Prince Alfred, because I haven't heard about it. I, I knew nothing about it. It happened in Clontarf in Sydney in 1868, and a man called Henry James O'Farrell just walked up and shot the prince out of the crowd. The prince survived. He was saved because the bullet went into his braces and didn't go through. Well, at least that's what some people say. Um, but poor old O'Farrell hung. 
and the event caused an absolute outpouring of anti-Irish sentiment and so many people escaped and headed for the gold fields which suited my story perfectly and so my characters went off to the gold fields at Hill End and the history obviously there is fascinating but what I found most interesting was the fact that there was a collection of three and a half thousand glass wet plate negatives which record life in New South Wales and Victoria during the gold rush. They're called the Holterman Collection, but they weren't found until the middle of the 20th century in a garden shed behind a house in North Sydney, which I thought was absolutely fascinating. And I'm convinced that there's a story lurking there somewhere. Definitely. <laughs> That's it. That's it. <laughs> oh, well, that was really lovely. Yeah, I, I like the idea of it being discovered in someone's backyard like it was so abandoned, but it's such a gold mine of, um, of history, really. Okay, next question and the final question. What do you hope readers will take away from your book? Well, I always like to kind of shine a bit of a light, not to make a pun because there's lots of lights in my book, but shine a little bit of a light on unknown roles or moments throughout history. So they always intrigue me and I hope that people learn something that they might not have known much about before. But I also hope that people are just genuinely entertained and that they're moved by the characters in my story and they kind of experience a whole spectrum of what it means to be human. So Marianne, what do you hope readers will take away from your book? Well, you know, the great irony for this novel was it, the day it came out was the day that Australia shut down for all the COVID-19 restrictions. And of course, from an author's point of view, you're like, oh, you know, um, all about me, sorry. But no, it's just this, what, what timing. But the irony, this incredible irony, life is so much like this, is this is about fortune and making your own chances and fortune in life and realising what's important. And I think... I like to think a lot of people reading this during lockdown would get the message and perhaps really resonate with it at the moment that um, life isn't always what you think it's going to be. And what's important is sometimes quite different to what you originally think. At the beginning, all the characters seem to want certain things. And by the end, they want other things, deeper things. And I think perhaps there's been a reflective time and perhaps the perfect time to read a book like this, I hope if that's the message people got that, you know, what is fortune really, you know, what, what's really important because I think we've all learned a bit of lesson about that in the past few months. Yeah, it certainly has hit home recently and um, I guess too that, you know, now that we're spending a lot more time inside and now it's winter as well too, there should be a lot more reading going on and hopefully um, people will, will take what they'd like to take out of out of that novel. Um, and Tia, we're over to you. Over to me. Over to you. Uh, over to me. So what will readers take from the book? Um, I believe that two people can read the same book and, and take something completely different from the story. You know, our individual interpretations of events, whether they're fact, fictional or fact, are shaped by our own experience. And right from the, from the moment that I started to write The Girl and the Painting, I wanted to answer the question, who was Miss Elizabeth Quinn? But as the story progressed, I discovered I was exploring something completely different. It was the issue of identity. What would happen to you if you woke up at the age of 60 and realised that you weren't the person you always believed yourself to be? We rely so much on what other people, what we're told about our childhood, and, and we just sort of blithely believe these stories. Will a reader take that from the story? Possibly. They might think that there's some more important things because there's the question of racism and women's rights and individual rights. But the bottom line is it's the story of Miss Elizabeth Quinn and I hope people enjoy her tale. Well, I, I have actually read it and, yes, I did enjoy it and I did it did sort of hit me a little bit about that, um, about that sort of like you get told that you're a certain person but it may not be exactly the truth but people sometimes don't tell the truth as a, a way of protecting people. No spoilers, please. No spoilers. <laughs> no spoilers. No, I'll try not to do any spoilers. Uh, can I just go um, for my answer, ditto? Ditto, ditto, ditto? Yeah, no, no. I mean, <laughs> you <everyone>, can. <laughs> everyone, 
thing they the other lady said so beautifully, but I, I guess I also want to want to add, I think that and I don't know an author who doesn't feel this way. You want everyone who reads your book to open up a little place in their heart and pop your story in there and hold it to to their heart. And I think too with The Darkest Shore, what I found when I was writing it and doing all the research, um, what it what it taught me and what I hope people take away from the book is how good people can be complicit in their own oppression, even really good people, but also how good people, when they unite and raise their voices together for a common cause, can defeat darkness, or at least not let darkness defeat them. And it's just a lesson that's so relevant still today in so many different spheres. And that's one thing that strikes me. And I know it strikes everyone who writes historical fiction or, or reads history, um, how much it keeps repeating itself and 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 that's really sad in so many ways do we learn from the past or are we doomed to repeat it i think it's a question i don't even know the answer to yet after all these years so there you go yeah i just hope everyone loves it so i'm going to ask a question and um if you feel like you you are the one who wants to answer it just stick your hand up um and and we'll go from there so um this question came from stephanie and it's, in a strong female character, how do you balance tough, gritty characteristics with a sense of humanity? Anybody? <laughs> oh, Mary Ann. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, well, it just occurred to me as soon as you said that, that to me, tough and gritty is heart. So, you know, um, what's the most important part of humanity to me is kindness and compassion and love. And so a tough, gritty woman like my grandmother was the most loving person I ever knew. So I feel that that goes hand in hand, you know, that it's sometimes you have to be very strong if you want to give great love. So I, I think, yes, as I said, I think it goes hand in hand. Well answered. Yeah, yeah I, I completely agree. I was going to say those characteristics aren't mutually exclusive. And for exactly the reasons Marianne said, great answer, Marianne. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else want to add input? Oh, Carrie does. I just wanted to say too that I think there can be a misconception with the idea that a strong female character means, you know, a kick-ass, physically strong, punching people out or <laughs> anything like that. And strength comes from the inside as well that your character can show strength emotionally you know um, and I think that ties into that greenness all those emotions actually tying in to having a big heart and being very very loving those things are strong you know it's not just Buffy the Vampire Slayer <laughs> isn't the <laughs> only kind of type of strong that they can be so just because your character may feel deeply just because they may be crying in a scene or or grieving for a long time or any of these things doesn't mean that they're not strong if that makes sense <laughs> yeah definitely can i just add something there what what you're saying is so true karen it makes me think of um christine bell another great australian writer who just wrote uh, no small shame a wonderful book and i was listening to her being interviewed and she said a wonderful thing that ties into all this and she said women in the past um, just because they didn't wear their feminism so obviously doesn't mean that they weren't strong, resilient and fighting for their rights, you know, that they, they had a quiet feminism. And I, I think that's a really lovely way to put it and ties into what you were saying. So there, I've just stolen Christine's words. I think she's um, tuned in tonight too. So thanks, Christine. <laughs> yeah, I can see her name up there. And um, Tia, did you have something to add or...? I don't think I've got anything else to say. I think everybody's covered it beautifully. Yeah, I <laughs> agree. Yeah, well done. Okay, I thought that would be a really tough question, but you girls nailed it. Okay, this one came from Nicole. Um, she just wants to know if you could all talk a little bit about your writing process and schedule. So anybody happy to share your, your secrets of writing um, that gets you published? <laughs> Oh, Karen, you're on mute. Hang on, I'm going to unmute you. No, go to Tia. Go to Tia first. <laughs> Tia. Tia was so busy watching you waving your hands around, she's forgotten what she was going to say. Um, <laughs> writing schedules. 
uh, I think I don't have one. I mean, it's a disaster. I have one in that I have a publication date, but I think that it's. Um, I think what a lot of people possibly don't realize is that you don't. You may have a book, one book published a year, but you're actually working on three books during that year. You're working on the book that you're writing. You're working on the book that you're editing and you're working on the book that you're doing the PR for and talking about in library talks and things like that. So it's it's not as organized as um, I thought it was going to be. I think I think I thought I was going to sit in my turret for six months, write a book, edit it and woohoo, it would be on the shelf. It's not like that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> how disappointing. <laughs> no. I, I, I think I it's hard work. work. Well, it's not so much the hard work. It's just that it's juggling. It's a lot of juggling, I think. Oh, Somebody else. Oh, here goes Karen. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'm, it's hard to shut me up once I get going. Sorry. Um, I was going to say, I, rem I agree with everything Tia said too, and I think that my girlfriend, Sarah Douglas, I remember when um, she really inspired me to start writing, and she said to me, whatever you do, Karen, treat it like a business. Because it's very easy to romanticise writing and the starving artist in the garret. I mean, that part's true. But apart from that, it's very <laughs> to romanticise it and what Tia's saying is right, it's a juggling act but I mean personally I, I sit down and I write anywhere between probably five to eight hours a day, five days a week and sometimes seven days when I'm in an editing stretch or have a deadline that I'm missing, um, whoo, there it goes. But um, yeah, and yeah, you're always juggling other books so as well, which is a lovely position to be in, isn't it? Um, so yeah usually three if not even more sometimes on the go but yeah I think to take it seriously and don't give up you know and and the key too is don't be afraid to edit and delete you know kill your darlings as they say <laughs> but it still hurts it hurts yeah so definitely you put all that you put all that effort in and it sounds so good but it just doesn't fit with the story yeah. I've been hearing that quite a lot from from authors and I, I, I'd like to add that um I completely agree with that just right just right and you can Rachel John said to me the other day you can always um, what is it you can't edit something that doesn't exist <laughs> you can't fix something that isn't there so I, that was really good advice I started writing a lot more after she said that to me but I was just going to show you this actually this is my little plotting book oh things are falling out of it don't worry about that but it's got like every book I've ever written has got my first notes in here and it's like my magic little Harry Potter book and I, I draw pictures in it it's a crazy mess of a thing but the reason I'm showing you that is just to remember to love it. It's it's the most fantastic job in the world, as maddening as it is. We get to dream up stories, put them on paper, and people read them. And to me, I, I didn't become an author until five years ago at 45, and I, I want to be an author my whole life. So every time I sit down, I start grumbling. I've got writer's block or anything, and then I think, you're dreaming up stories today. You're the luckiest person on the planet, you know. So it's a great privilege. And it's one of, don't forget the magic of that, is what I would say. Oh, such lovely advice. Thank you. Thank you. Harry? Just, yeah, I'd just add to that as well. I know when I was starting out writing, I very much thought there must be a right way and a wrong way of doing <laughs> it. And I actually have um, an article about this coming out next week with the wonderful Louise Allen, another gorgeous, gorgeous author, her Writers in the Attic series. I have a whole post coming out about searching for this mythical process that would sort of the key to Narnia would unlock what it is to be a writer, how I can be a published writer. And there is none. <laughs> I'm sorry to say it's it's very individual. It's what works for you. And it really is like the other wonderful ladies before me have said, just get the work done however works for you get those words down on the page because you can't go anywhere without words on the page oh, that's so inspiring so any writers out there don't give up just keep writing I, that's what i'm taking from that from those answers and um good luck if you are trying to um to write your novels or your stories whatever you're doing um we have an interesting one here from craig and Craig said, hi, Happy Valley Book Reads here. Hi, ladies, what's everyone working on writing now? So, anyone Can I just say hello to, to him first and, and how much we love the wonderful reviews that come from them because um, 
I always look forward to this. They seem to be very kind and they're wonderful support to us. So they thank are. you. Indeed. Uh, <laughs> fabulous guys. So supportive of Australian women writers or women writers. They're brilliant, brilliant. Okay, so anybody want to go first about I've what you're working on? <laughs> <laughs> um, what are you working on? Oh, I yeah, I'm happy to go first. Um, I've just finished, well, I've got a book coming out in November called The Cartographer's Secret, so that's pretty much finished. And I'm about halfway through my what will be my 2021 release. It's called The Paleontologist at the moment. Um, and I'm busy trekking around digging up fossils. It's been great fun. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like great fun. So, um, yeah, a lot of your books seem to have that kind of the physical link with the history, whether it's a painting or um, or a, a little trinket or something along the line. Okay. So, a platypus, maybe. <laughs> um, yeah. No, it's interested in. I, I sort of tend to explore things that um, I'm interested in I guess um, and that makes it a lot more fun. For me. Oh, we'll watch out for those ones. Mary Ann, do you have anything in the works? Um, uh, the edit is about to arrive for my new novel Sisters of Freedom which is a, a suffragette story. It's, it's very timely actually. I feel like it's it's really about oppression and, and objection to that so I'm Really excited about that. It comes out in March. But meanwhile, <laughs> I'm in a bit of a quandary because um, the, I'm writing two, two other novels and I don't know which one's going to follow it. So one of them is this really political post two feminism novel in the 60s and 70s. And the other one is my first ever contemporary, which I'm writing right now, which is about a bunch of surfaces like The Big Chill, you know, your flashback 20 years. So my head is all over the place. <laughs> I'm in all these different eras, all these characters. So I'm a little bit mad at the moment. <laughs> but it sounds interesting. <laughs> oh, it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> so just as long as the two don't start overlapping, it, it all works. <laughs> just don't ask my husband. I'm, I'm quite crazy at the moment. Anyway, that's all right. <laughs> that's all right. So good stories will come out of it. Kerry, what are you working on? So similarly to Maryam, I have two things on the go at the moment. <laughs> I know it's not always the wisest idea, but sometimes you just get so excited <laughs> about both ideas that you kind of keep flicking between the two to see which will take over. But both are historical fiction again. And once again, I am looking at moments or roles throughout history that probably aren't widely known about. And they both uh, have performing arts elements to them again, uh, because both my first books did, so it's kind of a recurring theme. But each one has a different performing arts in them. Unfortunately, there's not a lot I can say specifically about them, but I always post on my social media, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. So if I do get any concrete news, I will absolutely be sharing it there. So fingers crossed. <laughs> We'll look out for those um, coming up. <laughs> and Karen, what have you got in the works? Sure. I just handed in a manuscript on Monday, and that's a book that's coming out. <laughs> no, that's coming out next year. It's um, called The Mostly, in brackets, True Story of the Wife of Bath. And, you know, it's the, the woman from Chaucer's poem who we know married at the age of 12, had five husbands, loved sex, went on pilgrimages everywhere, and she was... She was a lady with a voice <laughs> and, and everything else. And um, she's always fascinated me. She's also a character in one of my earlier books, The Brewer's Tale. And this sort of buys into what Tia was saying and also will give hope to people who think, oh, you know, will my books ever be published? Um, the Brewer's Tale was published in Australia in um, 2014. And my agent sent it to America too, who liked it but sat on it and didn't do anything with it. And um, America fortunately subsequently published my next two books. And then out of the blue, um, late last year, said, oh, we're going to publish The Brewer's Tale now, but we're going to give it a different title. So they've called it The Lady Brewer of London. So I'm actually editing that for the American market at the moment. And what's interesting is The Wife of Bath appears in that book, but we meet her halfway through the story when she's 50 years old, uh, 50 plus, and the madam of a brothel. So the book I've just written takes her from 12 years of age up after her five marriages and how she becomes this madam. And, in, and now I'm sort of starting research with two ideas for two new books as well. 
Wow, so you, you've got a lot um, going on there. Did you find you had to change much of the story to make it for the American market? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, initially they said that, um, this is sort of ironic when you think about the market, they said there were two scenes that were too violent. And, you know, I sort of had to you know, cough in my elbow, <laughs> you know, which is sort of astonishing. But I think their readers, I don't know whether they're a little bit more sensitive or not. And I was prepared to do it. I was quite happy to do it. My God, I was going to be published in America, you know. I'd, 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 I'd cuff my, my left hand. Um, but uh, they changed their mind and they've actually left the story completely intact. And so it's just me going through it again just to see, um, work with their editor quickly. But basically it's just the spelling and a few other little tweaks here and there. So there you go. Wow, so less work So <laughs> that's oh, good. Unedited manuscript of uh, the mostly true story. They've already decided the title's a bit long, but they might do a bit more editing on that, I think. There's a lot of sex. So. <laughs> <laughs> And finally, we had a, a question. I think Vanessa is online with us as well too. And um, she's asking you guys, um, what was the last book you read that inspired you? Tia? I'm near my microphone. Oh, there you go. I'm just reading the, oh, God, no, I've forgotten the name of it, um, the, the dictionary one, the lost. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, um, what was it called? <laughs> The Lost the Dictionary Word. of Lost Words. Yep. Dictionary of Lost Words. It is amazing. I loved it. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. It's a wonderful premise. Um, and, and again, so much based in fact. I highly recommend it. I really do. I loved every moment of it. So what was it? It's a Dictionary of Lost Words? Of lost Words, yes. And I can't remember who wrote it either. Yep, which that's is okay. Okay. We'll look it, it up. <laughs> look it up. It's good. <laughs> loved it. Loved it? Oh. Mm -hmm. Who who else has a book that inspired them? I recently read um, Gravity is the Thing by Jacqueline Moriarty, who is Leanne Moriarty's little sister. And there's I think there's four writers in the family actually. And um, oh, it's just so beautiful. But I had the incredibly privi privilege of sitting next to her in English in high school. She's a really good friend growing up. And um, I knew Leanne as well, just to name drop. Oh, she probably doesn't remember me. But um, he, this book is just so beautiful. I mean, she was always this dreamy, whimsical person, and it just floats into the pages. I, I, it's one of those books I've set up to 3 o'clock in the morning, like, and hugged, you know, not just because I know it. So, read Gravity is the Thing. It's stunning. Stunning. So, Gravity is the Thing. Yeah. Jacqueline Moriarty. Jacqueline Moriarty. Okay. Uh, Karen? Yeah, I, I'm going to give... It's not a corny answer. Actually, I find every book I read inspiring because I love I love I love stories. But I love particularly what the one Tia mentioned too. But I actually um following the guys from Happy Valley Book Reads, I wrote down a lot of the books that they recommended, and they are just incredible. All the ladies here, their books are amazing. I can actually they are just wonderful, wonderful stories. And the one I'm reading at the moment um, is, and I'm loving it as well, is Elizabeth Gilbert, The City of Girls. The voice in that is marvellous. It's just rollicking and wonderful and quite unique. I, and I have to give a shout out too to Gulliver's Wife by Lauren Chater. That was just an incredible book. And I, yeah, no small shout. There's so many fabulous books. They all, uh, I get book envy or lexical envy. I wish I'd written it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, do you have much time for reading other people's work um, while you're working on your own? Actually, no, but you just make the time. But what I find is I don't read for pleasure until I've got my voice and my story firm in my head because I'm frightened I'll, I'll inadvertently um, mimic or something and that, that wouldn't be right. So, yeah, I wait till my ideas firm. Everyone's nodding. So the same. Yeah, I was going to say they're all nodding. <laughs> Oh, and Kerry, do you have a, a favourite one that you want to recommend? I'm actually reading right now our Hamnet, which is like Maggie O'Farrell's latest book. And it is, even though I've not finished it, it's been incredibly inspiring, literally from the first sentence. It's just got this lush language that I'm so envious <laughs> of. And it's completely vivid in the characterization and the descriptions and it was honestly like switching a movie on in my head. It's it's that vivid and it's stunning and beautiful and I have no idea how it ends because I'm still reading it, but I'm already so inspired by it. 
Oh, what was that one called again? You had a bit of a cracker when you. Oh, sorry, <laughs> it's Hamlet. So it's like Hamlet because it's um, Shakespeare's son was Hamlet, and he died when he was young. That's not a spoiler. <laughs> and um, so it's the story about the real life Hamlet that Hamlet <laughs> was named after. Ah, okay, so we'll have to keep an eye out for that one as well too. Now I'm having a look. That's all the questions that I have. Okay, there is a question here. Okay, um, from Christine. She says, "Thank you for the lovely reference to No Book Shame." Um, so she's saying some really lovely things. They totally go with all female characters have to be loud. Um, especially women of the past who often achieve their agency quietly. So question from Daryl, do you start with definitive views um, of how your will characters progress? How your will characters progress? Or do you find this changes the further you write your narratives? How your characters will progress? So do you find that you have definite views about, like, are you plotting the whole characters and what's going to be happening? Or are you just, as you, as the more you're reading, um, more that you're writing, do you find the characters develop and what you thought they were going to do is going to be something totally different? Can I attempt that one? Um, and because it just popped in my head and I'll forget it in a second. <laughs> uh, you know when you're dreaming and you have a complete character form in the dream. Um, I have very vivid dreams. I don't know about the rest of you. It might be a writer's thing. I don't know. But they find this character as you go along. And I find it doesn't matter what I go into a novel writing experience with, they be, they find themselves on the paper like they, or on the document. They they find themselves. It's like you, you wake up from a dream going, that was a complete person I've never met. And that's what happens. And you meet them. And it's like that you're holding hands with them all the way through and finding them which probably sounds really strange, but that, that's what it feels like for me. It's a dream on paper and they definitely evolve. And you might think at the beginning, I'm going to make her this, but then as you go along, you're like, oh, but she's she's softer than that or, or she's stronger than that and you find her or him. That's for me. Anybody else got anything? Karen? Yeah, they do become very real to you and I think they do evolve. And you, I do start out with, fairly set ideas of how I think the character will be, but they do, they take over. I used to think that that was a bit of, um, I don't know, author glamour or just a bit of nonsense, but it's not. It's absolutely true. And I'll tell you a dream I had. I don't normally dream very vividly my characters. I wish I did, but I was struggling naming a male character in one book. I had the female character, I had all the other characters. This is in The Chocolate Maker's Wife. And um, I had a dream where a man, a tall man with dark hair, tapped me on the shoulder and said, excuse me, my name is Matthew. And I never saw his face. And ah. he, he became Matthew. And, yeah, and, and I woke up going, oh, my God, oh, my God. I was so excited. Quick, and write I, it down. <laughs> yeah, I, he was there, but I never saw his face. But that's never happened to me before. So I, I've had the one one dream. But, yeah, they, they, I agree, they completely evolved. Yeah. Tia, did you have something? Um, um, well, uh, yes, what you were saying, they do evolve. I, I find I have to write my way into the character. So I've got a vague idea of where the story's going to go. And I'm not terribly good at plotting because even if I do, I go off at a tangent or the characters decide they want to do something else, which is exactly what you were saying, I think, Karen. Um, but it, it takes me probably about 20,000 words. And I have to write my way into the story and then I can go away and, and decide where they're going. And then the more I write, the stronger the character becomes. And then I inevitably go back to the beginning and get rid of half the stuff I wrote at the beginning. I think I was just getting to know them. And it all sounds a little fair. It really is. <laughs> but that's what happens. Yeah, so you've all got your own your own style. Um, does anybody else have anything to add to that question? Yeah, I think it's exactly the same as what everyone else said, in that it's almost like your characters push back if you try to make them do or think something that is not their character, they, they resist and the story just won't go there. And I'm very much a plotter. I know exactly how my story is going to play out. 
But even knowing all that, there's so much room for discovery. I discover my characters' motivations and their emotional reactions to things and that because I cannot put, no matter how hard I try, I can't push them in a direction that is just not natural for that character to go. It's almost like a physical sense. I can feel them pushing back at me going, no, you know that's not right. Go back and do it again right this time. <laughs> Oh, I love it. I love all of those answers. Um, it's very inspiring. Um, we've got uh, another question. How do you balance the book that you're promoting with the book that you're in the process of writing? <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I did today? I had to go back and read everything I ever did about this book because I've forgotten, like, Characters names like you're so embedded in the new one that I'm like, oh, what was that about again? You know, like I mean, of course it comes back to you pretty quickly, but does anyone else feel that way? You're sort of like, oh, you, almost like they're worlds and you're in other worlds. Yeah. I was at a literary festival once many years ago, and I got a question from the audience about one of my books, and I answered it, and somebody else said, no, that's not what happened. <laughs> forgotten because it was two years ago I wrote that book and I, just didn't, I got it completely wrong. I was so embarrassed but very grateful that someone had read it and had the answer. <laughs> uh, they obviously, it obviously made a good impression on them that they remembered exactly what happened. In well they made an impression on me but I think I made a bad impression. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you, does anybody else struggle with that as well? Constantly. <laughs> I, 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 I'm having a lot of trouble because so I'm juggling actually not three books but four because there's one that's just come out in the States as well. And I just, I have to actually sort of think twice and try and remember who's who. I did do one set of structural edits where I carefully went completely through and changed and had the wrong name in the story because I'd been writing something else. So I've learned, I've learned to stay away from it, you know. So I get, you really have to compartmentalise everything. You know, that goes in the green dress box, that goes in that box, that goes in that box. But it might just be me. Maybe I'm getting old. Yeah, it's almost like that thing where, you, where you're typing and someone's talking in the background and you accidentally type what they're saying instead of what you were you're meaning to do. It's kind of, it's going on in the background. So, you know, you might accidentally start focusing um, that in the wrong area. Anybody else um, have any ways that they deal with that? Kerry, did you have anything? Sorry, my <laughs> mic was freezing up on me for a bit there. No, I was actually really wanting to know the answer to that <laughs> question as well because I only have two books out and I have not found the balance yet. <laughs> Both of my books where they came out and all of a sudden I was thrown into this deep end of unfamiliar PR and promotions and publicity and I just kind of went panic stations a little bit <laughs> and went, how do I do this all? And sort of dropped the ball on the book I was working on at the time in order to make space for that. So I'm still trying to find that balance between working on one book and promoting the next one. So I was really eager to hear everyone's answers for that. Uh, do you, um, so I, have you gotten anything out of that? It's pretty much you just have to focus on what you're doing. <laughs> It sounds like, I guess it's like what I said about writing itself, there is no magic secret. <laughs> it's just about being prepared to do the work. Are there any events or periods in history you haven't written about but would love to? Yeah, I've got a mad one. I really want to write about ancient Egypt. And there's a lot of books about ancient Egypt, but I, oh, I, I just really want to write about that time and um, I have been to Egypt but I don't know maybe sometime in my life I'll come out with that but to me it was there was just so much drama you know and beauty and terror and you know. yes I'm going with Egypt <laughs> Uh, it, it, I mean, that would be interesting to see um, how that one turns out if you do manage to get that one pulled together. Does anybody else have a different period of history that they'd like to write about? Yeah, I wanted to write about ancient Greece and sort of involve, you know, use the 
the Homer's work and all that, and then Madeline Miller did it about a million times better than I ever could. So <laughs> <laughs> paid to that. Her book, they're, they're inspirational books. But no, seriously, I, I mean, I did want to write about that, but I also think I want to write about post-World War II and immigration to Australia and incorporate my family history a little bit into it, but fictionalise it because I lost um, my um, grandmother. They were all in concentration camps and all that and fled um, to Israel and, you know, Hitler's, and then to Australia and just um, do something about that. And I had a mother that was married eight times, so she makes the wife of Bath look pretty pretty ordinary, really. Um, so I think, um, yeah, I'd like to tackle a little bit of fictionalising the family history. So she's not quite um, Lola Montez, but, um, <laughs> you know, do, do something along those lines. And I think yeah. it's such an interesting period in Australia, you know, where we were trying to find our feet and there was so much going on, especially as an immigrant. Yeah. I'm just trying not to think about it because I've got my head full of too many other things. <laughs> <laughs> It's your fault. Don't me. I don't want any other ideas. Thank you. Just go away from me. <laughs> your historical research process, do you feel you do most of your research before you start writing or are there other things that come up you want to research as you go or perhaps once you start you go with more creative liberties <laughs> as you write so you don't feel like you have to fact check. So, um, a very quick short answer because we we're sort of over time now. So do you have to do a lot of fact checking or do you just go, I think we answered this a little bit anyway before, but you, you make it creative so the facts aren't quite so um, important. I think that's the... No, that was Mary Ann. <laughs> <laughs> I disagree with that completely. <laughs> I do I do lots of fact fact checking while I'm while I'm writing. Um, you, I you, I sort of check that the the general premise is okay, and then I actually start writing, and then I'm constantly checking bits and pieces all the way through, and then things sneak through, and you even find them in the structural edit that probably don't belong there because they're not historically accurate. Yeah. There'll there'll be someone who'll pick it up if it's not historically accurate. And, oh, yes. and let you know. oh, yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Um, I mean, it is. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm a stickler for facts, and I think that's the academic in me. And I I probably spend a year to two thoroughly researching and reading and writing and journals and everything, and then yeah, fact check as I go as well. And then inevitably a mistake will creep in or something that um I can't quite find the real evidence, and then I say to myself. You idiot! You're a fiction writer. It doesn't matter if it's made up. So, yeah, give, give myself a kick. Yeah. You just put that little um, disclaimer. This is a work yeah, 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 fiction yeah. in it's there. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Kerry, do you have um, a similar? Way to I'm do that? Not just for historical fact as well. And sorry, my connection dropped out briefly back there, so I left you all for a bit. Apologies for that. But no, I love getting historical fact correct where I can. Um, I think I might be influenced by when I was first, you know, taking courses and learning how to write. I was lucky enough to meet Marcus Zusak, and he was talking about his experience with the book thief and how much work he went to to get it all historically accurate and correct. And someone emailed him saying, you know, in chapter whichever, one of your characters plucked an apple off a tree and bit into it. That type of apple did not grow in that area in that specific year, in that season. <laughs> and oh, so he just, my goodness. No one can get everything right. I was just going to say that when you write historical fiction, one of the great joys is that you already have a bit of a plot because you, you follow in history. So, you know, you, you're sort of, oh, what am I going to say next? Well, what happened that month in that year? And it's, it's I love that. It's like cheating. <laughs> <laughs> I think that brings us, um, we've had a couple of messages just saying thank you for people who've had to um, had to leave, but um, I would just like to, um, to also thank you, um, all of you, Tia, Marianne, Kerry and Karen for coming tonight. Um, it was a fascinating insight into historical fiction and into your writing and into your personalities and your, and your styles of writing as well too, which is just invaluable. Um, if you'd like to, if anybody would like to find out more, you can obviously visit the HarperCollins um, website to, to find out a little bit more about these authors. 
and you can visit our libraries. Our libraries um, have all of your books. We have them all there. I've checked. Um, a couple are also online, which I've downloaded and I'm madly trying to read off my phone. <laughs> um, so you can jump onto the library app or visit our website to reserve a copy today. Um, I'm very, very super pleased to announce that our libraries are almost back to normal. We've got a lot more opening up. So um, go and pop down and, and see what you can find in your library. And of course, if you're wishing to purchase a copy for a gift or for yourself to read, um, just consider supporting our local booksellers who are always great supporters of our author talk. So i just like to thank everybody um, who's attended tonight and especially our authors um, for joining us and I hope you have a lovely evening. Thank you. And thank you for the invitation. Yeah, thank you so much for having us and thank you to everyone for coming and love you guys. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Bye, -bye. Bye. 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 Bye.